coming. Um, I guess how many people came because they liked the title? Okay. All right. And how many people came because they did not like the title? <laughs> well, um, yeah, it means a lot for you all to be here, so thank you. Um, you're walking down the street. It's a beautiful day. Suddenly, and for no apparent reason, out of the corner of your eye, you see this clenched hand, and it's coming for you, and it socks you right in the face, completely unexpectedly. I want to know what you would do. How many people in here would retaliate immediately, no hesitation at all? That's right. <laughs> and how many people in here would have retreated just as quickly, again, without any thought? Right? Well, if you're like me, you would have done neither. You would have picked yourself up and somehow found a way of giving this complete stranger who just rocked your world for no apparent reason you would have somehow found a way of giving him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he slipped. Or maybe he just uh, made the unfortunate mistake of thinking you were somebody else, a mortal enemy of his or something. Point is, you would, have, you would have gotten up, you would have smiled, you would have laughed, and you would have forgiven him, perhaps even going so far so as to apologize for having gotten your face in the way of his rapidly approaching face in the first place. <laughs> And for 28 years, this has been my style. And after three years at Naropa, a dis de definitively compassionate university grounded in the likes of acceptance and tolerance and forgiveness, I am proud to say that I am more likely than ever before to do everything that I can to knock that person out. <laughs> and I consider that decidedly healthy. So the issue is not that I didn't retaliate. The issue is that it didn't even occur to me that I could. Mm. See, I, was, I, was, I didn't have options. I was stuck responding to the world in this one way. I was stuck responding out of the neurotic version of feminine energy, and I'll talk about that at detail today, in detail. In becoming unstuck and expanding my field of choice, it's necessitated a conscious reclaiming of my repressed masculine energy, thus the title of today's pre presentation, Reclaiming Our Inner Masculine. Um, the work has been, for me, highly challenging and disturbing and objectionable and ultimately paramount to my maturation as an individual, to my effectiveness as a counselor. And what I am proposing is that many of us therapists could potentially benefit from a similar journey. So I want to offer a quick little disclaimer before we get uh, going too far. Yes, I'm using the terms feminine and masculine, and I know that they carry a certain charge, and I know that we all have our own ideas about what they mean, and my request to you today is that you don't get so hung up on the terms themselves that you lose sight of the heart of the presentation. So when I use feminine, I'm referring to the energy of connection. And when I use masculine, I'm referring to the energy of separateness. Um, this will make more sense in a couple moments. So I'm doing this just because it's how they were used in my research. Uh, it's not a male-female thing. It really has nothing at all to do with gender. So I just want to make that clear. OK, so as life forms, we are at all times both connected and separate, both feminine and masculine. I am connected with everything around me, inextricably interwoven with the fabric of being. If you were to take away that which surrounds me, my environment and its myriad of forms, I would cease to exist entirely. So that's represented by these blue lines here. You may, I was gonna say you may not like them, but I think everyone here probably loves the fact that we're connected. But I was gonna say you may not like them, but you cannot simply erase them. They're there to stay, right? And at the same time, that I'm completely connected, I'm unequivocally separate. I am boundaried by my own body. You cannot merge with me completely. You can never know the complexities of my inner world and all of their intricacies, and I cannot know yours. So this fact, of course, is represented by the red individual bodies. So the point is that at the same time we are all fundamentally connected, we are also existentially alone. Okay. But why is, oh, oh right, I thought about that. Thank you. Um, 
I thought you were pointing at my fly, so this was a better <laughs> alternative. <laughs> um, so why should this matter to us? Why is it important? It's important because our connectedness and our separateness, they manifest themselves in different ways, and so they give us access to distinct but equally important skill sets. When we act out of our feminine style of connecting, we display an ability to accept, to support, and to move towards the other, a willingness to temporarily set aside our own needs to take care of somebody else. We act from empathy and kindness and tolerance and compassion. So the feminine is the basis of relationship. On the other hand, when we act from our masculine separateness, we display an ability to assert ourselves, to individuate, to rest in our personal aloneness. We have boundaries, we express our needs, we engage in conflict, and we hold on to our integrity. So this is the basis of self. And we're healthy when we're at this point in the middle, when we're operating with equal access to both energies, when I'm consciously identified with both my feminine and my masculine. However, things rarely work out that smoothly, um, and we rarely arrive in adulthood equally skilled in our feminine and our masculine capacities. This means that we rarely arrive in adulthood um, with a full range of choices at our disposal. And this happens because in childhood, we start to favor one way of being over the other. So to take my own life as an example, I learned that I was better off when I acted out of my feminine connecting qualities. When I was, when I smiled or when I was accommodating, when I acted kind and caring, when I was compliant, when I pretended that everything was okay, I was more likely to receive some version of love and praise and attention. So feminine or connecting became synonymous with good. Now, at the same time that I was learning feminine was good, I was also learning that masculine was quote unquote bad. Because when I did respond out of my separateness, when I was angry or assertive or acted independent, I exposed myself to some version of abandonment, rejection, or neglect the way all of us are want to experience in our childhood from time to time. So the result was feminine good, masculine bad. I pushed my masculine outside of my behavior and subsequently outside of my awareness. As you can see here, it's subtle, but this circle is starting to shift. I'm going into my feminine away from my masculine. And over time, this trend continues. I, become more, I became more well-versed in my connecting capacities, more comfortable acting out of my feminine, and I became more distant and removed from my separateness capacities. Eventually, I achieved this neurotic organization. So, neurotic organization, it's actually a healthy developmental attainment in childhood. It's an intelligent response to our particular emotional environment. Neurotic organization is a repressive capacity that allows us to push outside of our behavior and of our awareness those aspects of ourselves that have made our lives difficult up until that point. So neurotic organization essentially makes our lives safer and more predictable. As you can see for me, I became exclusively identified with my feminine, I pushed my masculine into the realm of my unconscious, and this fundamental split between feminine and masculine, between these, these two energies, it happens for many of us to varying degrees. And of course this can be flipped, right? It's not like we're all in neurotic feminine. You can easily flip it based on childhood experiences. Um, but why neurotic? Why does it become the neurotic feminine? How come exclusive identification with either style results in that style manifesting in its neurotic form? So neurotic is defined as unbalanced. So feminine that lacks access to masculine is unbalanced feminine or neurotic feminine. It means that we get hooked into one way of being and that our ability to operate from anywhere on this spectrum when we want to and with choice no longer exists. And this poses problems. 
if I end up in the neurotic expression of the feminine. It is because I learned at a young age that I stood a better chance at survival by remaining in relationship no matter the cost to myself. My unconscious belief is that my survival requires that I maintain connection, so I always prioritize relationship, and I oftentimes compromise who I am and give up my integrity along the way. And it's extreme form, this is victim energy. It's, I need you, so it doesn't really matter how you treat me. I'm gonna pretend I can't do anything about it because I don't wanna risk losing you. The relationship is more important to my survival. Now, if I end up in the neurotic form of the masculine, it's because the opposite happened. I learned at a young age that I had a better chance at survival by protecting myself no matter the cost to my relationships. I see relationships as threatening to who I am, and in, ex in its extreme form, this is perpetrator energy. It doesn't matter how I treat you because ultimately I don't need you. And beyond that, I might even see you as an actual threat. So in order to protect myself, I erase you. Is it making sense? Okay. <laughs> well, okay, so you saw from the previous slide that for me, for my part, I became primarily identified with my feminine style, which meant that I had a propensity for slipping into its neurotic expression. This was problematic. I constantly accommodated at the expense of my own well-being. I didn't stand my ground. I changed myself for whoever I happened to be around. I pretended to be powerless and at the mercy of others because I was unwilling to challenge them because if I did, then I could risk losing them. And so taking this from this personal level to a therapeutic level, what I'm, what I'm proposing is that many therapists are like myself at risk of sliding into the neurotic feminine, for it is the very aspects of the feminine that many of us so naturally embody and we're so skilled at, empathy, kindness, concern for others, that would have propelled us to this profession in the first place. So assuming that neurotic organization is at least a somewhat common phenomenon, then there is a likelihood that many of us achieved it in childhood and we became primarily identified with our feminine to, at the expense of our masculine. So when we take that and when we add to it the, the emphasis that our training here at Naropa and probably as counselors anywhere puts on the connecting qualities of the feminine, our potential masculine skill set gets repressed all the more. The result is that we sometimes slide into the neurotic feminine, not all of the time, but some of the time. And when we do, it could impede the therapeutic progress that we're able to make with our clients. Okay. Um, because ideally, as therapists, we're able to do this delicate dance between, between gentleness and challenge, between warmth and kindness and unconditional positive regard and non-judgment and directness and assertiveness and confrontation. And many of us are incredibly skilled in this former half and oftentimes it is precisely what our clients need. But there may be times where our clients could benefit from interventions that derive from this, this other half, right? This masculine half. And if we haven't practiced those, if we're not comfortable operating out of the masculine, then we're ultimately going to be limited in what we can offer our clients. We act compulsively from one way of being. Sometimes we hit the mark, sometimes it's exactly what our client needs, and sometimes we're just off the mark. So if our profound compassion isn't held in check, isn't held in balance by appropriate and healthy boundaries, we may exhaust ourselves as we do everything we can to try to help our clients improve. Instead of just caring for our clients, we pick our clients up, put our clients on the back, and carry our clients. Not only is this potentially detrimental to our own well-being, but it's unlikely to instill in the client any marked degree of self-confidence. And because if I'm in the neurotic feminine, I prioritize relationship above all else, 
I may accept my client's versions of reality without question, and I may not share with my client certain insights that, though potentially helpful, may also be difficult or disturbing or even painful for the client to hear. Because oftentimes the path to change is through pain, because pain leads to interest and motivation. But if my client objects to feeling pain, and if I continually accommodate those objections as a way of avoiding conflict, then I will be induced into collaborating with my client, thus ensuring the continuity of their problematic identity dramas. The point that I'm making here is that we want to have as much choice as possible so that we can cater to, to whomever happens to be sitting across from us. And if we lack access to the masculine, then we're going to lack access to the amount of choice that, we're going to, that we could potentially have. Okay, that is the issue. This is the solution. <laughs> um, we reduce the risk of operating from the neurotic version of the feminine and increasing our range of choices by reclaiming conscious ownership of the repressed masculine. And because the neurotic feminine is a survival strategy at its core, because we have a better chance at survival by staying in relationship, challenging that is a counter-instinctual practice. When I choose my own well-being, my unconscious fear is that I am risking losing relationship and that I won't be okay. So as paradoxical as it may sound, when I choose my own well-being, I might actually feel as though I am choosing my own annihilation but I do it anyways. This quote down here is from Bruce Tift. Neurosis is always a substitute for experiential intensity. Um, so if we're, if we're interested in trying on a new way of being, then we're going to have to feel disturbance that we've been living our lives avoiding having an experience with up till that point. Um, so we, we, choose, we go into our fear, we take on these new ways of being, the more we go into our fear and come out the other side, the less threatening that fear becomes. And we practice working the muscle of the masculine. So working the muscle of the masculine, it's like working a muscle that's in our body. It's just been lying dormant for years. It's there, but it's small and maybe it's weak. And training it, getting it into shape is initially uncomfortable and initially awkward and challenging but we only get it into shape by training it consistently and de deliberately. And we do this by intentionally calling forth masculine styles of behavior. If we're interested in that work, we're probably gonna wanna begin by giving ourselves permission to feel like a perpetrator. Because when we respond from the masculine, when we put up boundaries and say no and assert ourselves, these aren't malicious acts, they're not perpetrating acts. But because they are new and foreign, and because they derive from the masculine, it's likely that we might feel as though we're behaving like a bad person or like a perpetrator when we do them. So we have to be willing to tolerate those feelings, knowing we're not actually behaving in a perpetrating way if we're interested in taking on this new way of being. And one of the things that we can do once we've got that first thing checked off the list, I suppose, is to intentionally seek out conflict. And this isn't big conflicts, but little conflicts like, uh, I remember when I sent my food back at a restaurant because it was too cold, I thought that was scary. <laughs> and I was like <laughs> the worst person in the world. But um, the, I did it and I survived. I came out the other side, I was still alive. I was like, whoa. So, the point is that you can have conflict and learn that you're okay and you start to get more comfortable in conflict so that when it's unavoidable, you can show up more fully. Um, we insist on our own reality. So instead of queuing off of the reality of others, we insist on our own. Um, we don't give up or we stop giving up our own integrity in order to purchase love and approval. Our relationship with ourselves is a higher priority than our relationship with anybody else on the planet. And I, this is one of those things where I threw it in at the last second and now I forgot what I wanted to say. But give ourselves permission to feel like separate people. So I suppose that our impulse to always remain in connection is indicative 
of a desire to not actually have to feel the other half of the equation, the separateness. So it's part of that um, going into the experiential intensity, checking it out, feeling like a separate person, seeing if I'm okay, and if I am, then starting to get more comfortable behaving from that side. So when, isn't that a great slide? <laughs> when we are capable of engaging with the world from any place on this feminine and masculine continuum, we will find that a full range of possibilities awaits us regardless of the circumstance, that we act from a place of choice and not compulsion. And if we do get punched in the face, then we choose between laughing it off, fighting back, exiting the scene, inviting the guy over for dinner, perhaps <laughs> taking the opportunity to lecture him on proper social norms. And for those of us in the neurotic feminine, we get there through a conscious and deliberate reclaiming of our masculine energy. And we will likely find that this will improve the quality of our lives and of our relationships, both on a personal level and a therapeutic level, in part because our field of choice will expand. So a conscious reclaiming of the masculine, it's not like it's creating something new out of thin air. It's merely bringing us into touch with the way things are because we are already whole and we have just forgotten it. So we are but making our wholeness conscious. Thank you. <sighs> that feels good. Thank you for that applause. <laughs> Are there any questions that I can answer? I'm wondering yeah. about like, kind of swinging between those two ends of like the neurotic feminine and the neurotic masculine. Because I think, I think I see right. in myself a tendency to kind of swing more to the masculine side, uh -huh. but as a response to like, okay, I can't be in this neurotic feminine side, like yeah. to assert myself and then going too far with it. Right, so right. I wonder about that, like maintaining balance when you swing the other direction. Right, I think that's a, a great point. I think that happens a lot in that for myself being more inclined to be on the neurotic side of the feminine, underneath that is the perpetrator energy of the masculine. It's like the shadow side of the feminine. And if I don't have a conscious relationship with my masculine qualities, then I'm more at risk of sliding into its extreme form when I do operate out of it. So it's, instead of like gradations, you know, where we can deliberately choose to be here, 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 in asserting ourselves, we like find ourselves all the way over there on this perpetrating end. Um, so does that kind of answer your question so, yeah. a little bit? Right, so, um, so yeah, practicing it deliberately before we actually have to engage in it might give us more options as to where we want to be on that spectrum. Yeah? Is this the kind of thing that you might share sort of overtly with a client if you noticed that they were kind of stuck in a neurotic? I talk about this a ton with them. Yeah. And would you, would you talk about it in a different way than you just spoke to us about it? Like, is there any way you kind of like, I don't know, shift it in order to present it to a client or would you be this kind of overt about it? I'd be pretty overt about it. And is that an example of moving into the mountain? I think so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, but I would be. I, I do share it with them and I speak about it in a very similar way. Yeah. Uh-huh. Hi. Yeah, hi. What have you <laughs> learned about your masculine side that was producing shadow? Um. I think that, I think I've learned that like, I don't need to apologize for existing, that I'm worthy of being here just as I am, that um, my truth and my reality is just as important and just as valid as anybody else's, that in times of conflict, I don't need to erase myself or compromise myself in order to soothe things over, that I don't need to give away my own integrity in order to feel better that I can instead stand up for myself and stand my ground and that it's uncomfortable at first because it feels like I'm not gonna be okay, but um, 
on the other side is a lot of freedom and a lot of confidence, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Forcing away and attaching to self as being sort of the ultimate goal. Yeah. I'm curious if you made that correlation or if you think it's appropriate or if um, you say something different. I. I do think that in many s cases it's appropriate, but I'm certainly an island, mm -hmm. even though I'm in the neurotic feminine. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe across the board you would find a lot of correlation between the two, but not all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember before even deciding to become a therapist that some people would talk about this field is that almost everybody comes with issues around attachment or their individual I mean connection or their individuality kind of struggling to be a solo self or something about belonging and connection so I feel like this is true and if the if you're inviting more of the kind of conscious form of the masculine with somebody that is actually a lot more let's say islandy or like not wanting to be in connection or not in healthy connection how might you bring that? What would that look like? Do you understand the question? No. Okay. <laughs> so island, okay. island, so how to say, bring so them into connection. This form of reclaimed masculinity to deal with somebody who is on the neurotic masculine end. Oh, so somebody who's a neurotic masculine, how would I work yeah. with this? Um, well, if I'm understanding your question, then it's the opposite of what I presented, right? Because I was talking about moving into the masculine from neurotic feminine, but f to move in the, to the direction of feminine from neurotic masculine, it'd be like the opposite of the, like give yourself permission to feel like a victim. Step into the vulnerability of what it's like to, to not be totally in control of all the situations, to feel your helplessness and powerlessness, um, to, to give yourself permission to feel like a completely connected and dependent person. Because our safety, the safety of the neurotic masculine is in separating and distancing from anything because of threats out there. But they're already connected and independent. That's because they see this as so threatening speaks to the degree to which they're connected and dependent. So I would, I would just encourage that client to actually to come into touch with what they're avoiding, which is connection. Um, is that helpful a little bit? Okay, cool. Thank you. One more question. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You could say more about insisting on your own reality. I felt like there was like a lot of depth to that. Um, yeah, I think that, I think that one of the beauties of the, somebody who's in the feminine, like me, is that we are, really willing to be influenced and changed and challenged by our environment and there's a lot of health in that but there's in its extreme form we're constantly changing we don't really know like where we stand or what our reality is so it's hard to have like a really strong and solid sense of self um, so this is the antidotal practice to not knowing where you stand all the time is to actually start to take a stand on things and that when you're, you have both your feet firmly planted in the ground, you're harder to push around because you're like, this is my reality. You might have a different version of reality, that's fine, but I'm not gonna compromise myself or let go of this in order to merge with yours. Yeah, cool, thank you. Thank you guys very much.